Well, I'd like to welcome you back to the Tabernacle and the Desert series that we've been studying. On this series of studies, we will be looking at the Day of Atonement, and I've broken it into six different parts so that each one won't be too long. So today we'll uh, get started on this with part one. So like I said, we've been studying God's salvation plan, and I have broken it into four stages. And today we're continuing with our stage two, and I call that the teaching plan. Well, in today's study, we'll focus in on the yearly service called the Day of Atonement. By the way, you can send comments or questions to me at this email address, art2023 at cambeeg.com. So as we study this service, I want you to remember that this earthly service is just a teaching illustration of God's plan of salvation. So this is what God has intended for this. It's to illustrate to us his plan of salvation that's uh, being undertaken both on earth and in heaven. So, what's our goal for this video series? Well, the Godhead, that's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are executing their salvation plan to save for eternity as many people on earth as possible that will faithfully trust them and follow their plan. So I think that's the first part of my objective. Secondly, God activated or put this plan in place at or from the foundation of the world. And I'll be talking more about that in a few moments here. And thirdly, this video series shares my understanding of God's salvation plan with you for your consideration. Now, I hope you uh, take the time to get through all of this and watch it in, this, in the uh, sequence that we have produced it because each video builds upon the next. So we're going to take a look at the big picture first. Well, as I mentioned, this is a, a, the a sacrifice in the desert. This was a teaching service. Now, don't forget that the Israelites were held captive for f over uh, 430 years in Egypt, and they had forgotten most of what God had taught them about the uh, sacrificial services. So this tabernacle service that we've been studying is really a teaching aid that God has put in place for the Israelites and, and now later for us so that we can learn what God's salvation plan is all about. And of course, the actual plan is being executed by God the Father and by Jesus and uh, by the Holy Spirit. So this is a teaching plan, but it points to the actual service that Jesus uh, is undertaking. So I've got a couple slides here that are very interesting uh, and as a, uh, as a foundation for our studies. So here we have a title that says Earth's Foundation and then After, after the foundation was put in place. Well, after the foundation was put in place, God created the earth and all the living things on earth, including mankind. And that was all created by Jesus. Now let's take a look at this text in Revelation 13, verse 8. And we'll go into this in a little more detail. This is a very interesting text. It says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life. In other words, everyone that is lost, their names are not in the book of life, of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 
So this is a bit of an odd way of, of putting it in a way, but it talks about that everyone on earth that is basically lost at some point in time, they will worship God. So their name is not, it says it has not been written in the book of life. So they're lost. So let's consider what this Bible text is saying. Let's look at it a little more in detail. So I've broken it down into four parts here. All of the lost souls on earth will eventually worship Jesus. And you can read this in Philippians 2, verse 10. It says, at the name of Jesus, it says, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So there will come a day when every knee will bow to Jesus and worship him. All right, number two. The lost souls, their names are not written in the book of life. So if your name is not in the book of life, that means you will not be saved into heaven. You won't be able to get into New Jerusalem in heaven. So you are lost and you will eventually be burned up uh, and be ashes under everyone's feet. So the book of life was written and sealed before the earth and mankind were created. It says in the text that we just read, it says from the foundation of the, of the world. And you can read that again in Revelation 6.1. And finally, number four, we read, it says God the Father planned that Jesus, and Jesus is the innocent lamb, Jesus was going to be slain for mankind's sins before the earth and everything in it was created. So the plan that was created in heaven to save us, for Jesus to come to earth and live and die a sinless life, that plan was put together and put in place before anything on earth was created, before any animals were created before the trees and the plants were created before Adam and Eve were even created. God had already looked ahead and nothing catches God uh, with uh, flat footed. He was planning just in case man should sin. He already had a plan in place to save mankind. So we can see from number four that I just read that God anticipated that mankind, starting from Adam and Eve, would sin. So God made provisions for mankind to have time to consider Jesus' salvation offer and be saved. So how did God make provisions for mankind to consider Jesus' offer? This is what we're going to be looking at uh, in our studies here, in these uh, video studies. So, God, so keep God's plan in mind as we go through this study and as we study the atonement topic. This is God's plan that he put in place before he even created mankind. He, he planned this out, and this is the plan that he is executing to, to even today. All right, let's take a look at God's salvation plan. Well, God created Adam and Eve, and he put them in, in the garden. And there was a tree planted in the garden, and it was called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what did God tell Adam and Eve? He said, do not eat of that tree, for in the day that you eat of that tree, you're going to pay a penalty and it's called immediate death. So the day that they were to eat of that tree that God told them not to, they were going to be killed. So on the very day that Adam and Eve sinned, 
Jesus volunteered to pay their price for their sin and even the entire world's price for sinning, and he delayed their immediate death. And this is what I'm calling corporate atonement. So even though God said, in the day that you eat of this this tree and the fruit of this tree, in the very day that you eat of it, you'll die, Jesus volunteered and stepped in the way, and he volunteered to pay their price. And so Jesus invites everyone to accept his sacrifice and find salvation on an individual basis. And this is called individual atonement. So corporate atonement is is different. Corporate atonement gives everyone the opportunity to consider God's offer of salvation. And when they have considered it and accepted it, That's called individual atonement. If they considered God's uh, salvation opportunity and they reject it, well, then they're lost. So looking again at this corporate atonement, let's see if we can find a Bible text. In Romans 5, verse 8, we read, But God the Father, I've added that in here, I put these little brackets, But God the Father showed his great love for us by sending his sinless Son, that's uh, Jesus Christ, to die for us while we were still sinners. So God anticipated that we were going to sin, and he made provisions for that through his Son Jesus and his sinless life. So while Adam and Eve were still sinners, and they did not repent or confess their sins, Jesus volunteered to cover their sins by his future sacrifice on the cross. And I'm calling this corporate atonement. And we will be looking at this as we go through our study. So we will be looking both at corporate atonement and individual atonement. So think about this. Jesus, the creator of the universe, volunteered his life to save you from your sins and freely freely offer you eternal life. Can you imagine that? The creator of the entire universe that we can't even imagine. It's so large and so complex that this God, this God Jesus, volunteered to come and die a sinless life so that we might obtain eternal life through acceptance of his sacrifice. Well, let's continue with a little bit of history here. Let's go back to the Israelites escaping from Egypt. So they crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. In Exodus we read, And the Lord said to Moses, Tell the children of Israel to go forward. But Moses, lift up your rod and stretch your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord made the sea into dry land. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the Egyptians pursued them. Then the waters returned and covered them, and the army of the Pharaoh, not so much as one of the Pharaoh's army, remained. They were all killed. So this is a little bit of history leading up to the sanctuary in the desert. So the uh, Israelites walked across where the Red Sea was on dry ground. Later, we find in Exodus 3, we find that Moses met with God on Mount Sinai. And what did he do there? God gave Moses exact instructions on how to build a sanctuary in the desert, to, for Jesus to dwell among them. 
So he gave him instructions on how to build the buildings and the furniture and how to conduct the services. So this is a little picture of the sanctuary in the desert. We read in Exodus 1. It says, Then the Lord Jesus spoke to Moses, Let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. Make it according to all that I have shown you, that is, the pattern of the sanctuary in heaven, and the pattern in all its furnishings you shall make it. So this whole tabernacle in the desert was was detailed out by God, and he gave him the exact specifications on how to make it and what material to make it out of, etc. Now, I have other videos where I go into all these various aspects of the tabernacle, but I'm going to just give you an overview here. Uh, this was the entrance. You uh, ent entered into the tabernacle area uh, from the east, and this were, was the entrance area. And this is called the courtyard in the Bible. And there were two altars, and the one outside here is called the bronze altar. It's also called the brazen altar, or also the altar of burnt offering. Then there's a, bo a bowl here, a large bowl. It's called a laver. It's really a water basin for the priests to wash themselves and to clean themselves up. Then this building here, it's kind of a funny name. It's called a tent of meeting. And this building had two rooms in it, the holy and the most holy room. And so the holy room was in the front and the most holy room was in the back. And in the holy room, there were golden candlesticks there that lit up the room and illuminated it. There was also a table of showbread where the priests would put out uh, bread uh, there daily. And there was also another, a second altar. So the one outside in the courtyard is called the bronze altar. And the one inside here is called the altar of incense. Now this altar of incense was made out of gold, it was overladen with gold. And in the most holy room, we find the Ark of the Testament, and that was overladen with gold, and it had uh, golden angels uh, overlooking it also. So this is, uh, for those that hadn't looked at my prior videos, this is a kind of an overview of the uh, tabernacle. So what we're going to look at now are the atonement services that are conducted in the tabernacle. There were two different atonement services that were conducted each day in the sanctuary. The first one is called the individual atonement, and this was for personal sins. The second one was what I'm calling corporate atonement, and it's also called the daily uh, in the Bible, and this was for the general camp's sins. And so we'll go through both of these here in the next few minutes. So as far as personal sins are concerned, they were, they were uh, conducted at the bronze altar, and the individual would come to the bronze altar with their sacrifice, and it could be a lamb or it could be other animals for uh, people that weren't as wealthy that could not afford a lamb. So daily... There were individual and family sins were brought to the bronze altar and they were confessed here. There was also corporate sins or the camp sins and they were conducted also every day. And there was one lamb sacrificed in the morning and a separate uh, lamb that was sacrificed in the evening. And these lambs were for the general corporate sins of the uh, Israelites that were encamped or about the tabernacle. 
So there were the two different services were the personal atonement sins were confessed and the corporate sins were confessed and uh, asked forgiveness. So how did this work? Well, for individual sins, the head of the family would come and he would confess his sins and those sins of his family. And he would bring with him a lamb. Now this lamb would have to be perfect. And this uh, pointed forward to Jesus. Jesus is called the, the lamb of God. And the officiating uh, priest at this service was just a regular priest. And so how did this work? Well, the sinner would come and he would confess his sins uh, and his family's sins. And he's put, put his hands on the head of the lamb and the lamb's throat would be cut and it would die. And the blood from the lamb would be collected in a small basin. And that blood would be put on the horns on this uh, altar here, the altar of burnt offering. So the person would come, confess his sins, the lamb would be sacrificed, and his, the blood that was collected would be put into the sanctuary, and his sins would be forgiven from uh, his sins and his family's sins would be forgiven. Now, the other service that goes on daily is called the daily uh, service or the corporate or camp atonement. And like I mentioned, this happens twice a day. And this is also officiated by a regular priest. So sins that were committed by the leaders or the general population were daily confessed at the bronze altar. And also the blood was sprinkled on the golden altar of incense. So the sins were transferred from the encampment, from the people that were encamped around the sanctuary, and daily, because of these two offerings that they would uh, sacrifice, these sins were transferred into the sanctuary, both on the bronze altar and then inside on the golden uh, altar. So both altars were associated with the corporate or camp atonement. So starting with Adam and Eve and their children, they built altars to God and sacrificed animals for forgiveness of their sins. And then later the Israelites in the temple service, they sacrificed animals for their sins. And all the services at the t uh, tabernacle all point to Jesus' future sacrifice for all sinners. So the sacrifices, whether they were just on a, a stone uh, altar or they were done in the tabernacle, they were all pointing forward to the sacrifice that Jesus would, would make on the cross. Well, that's the end of part one of our multi-part series. So again, if you have any comments or questions, please send them to my email address at art2023 at cambeague.com. And you'll notice here also, I have a lot more videos that you can view. This is my podcast and you can go to HTTPS and it's called BibleProphecy.Libsyn, that, that's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. That's the company that hosts my podcast. And so you'll be able to see this podcast there, plus all my other podcasts that I've uh, produced. So I hope you uh, take time now to view the other uh, two through six of this series on the Day of Atonement. Welcome back to the uh, Tabernacle in the Desert. 
Today we're going to continue with our study of the Day of Atonement. If you haven't had the opportunity to view part one, I would suggest that you stop right now and go back and pick up part one first. Because if you watch these in sequence, they make a lot more sense to you than watching them out of sequence. So we're going to start off by looking at corporate atonement. This is a term that is not very familiar with uh, many people, but it's a very biblical term. So twice daily uh, in the uh, temple, they had corporate atonement. This occurred twice a day. So sins committed by the leaders and the general population were daily confessed at the bronze altar and then also at the golden altar of incense. So this corporate atonement was officiated by the regular priests and they brought with them in the morning a, a lamb for sacrifice and in the evening they brought another lamb for sacrifice. And with these two separate lambs, the corporate sins of the nation were transferred twice daily into the sanctuary. So you might ask, when did this corporate atonement start and what is it all about? Let's take a look at this. So if we go back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, we know that God told Adam and Eve, he told them, do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But they didn't uh, obey God. And God told them that the penalty was that if they did eat of that tree, they would immediately die in that very day. That was immediate death sentence if they disobeyed God and ate from that tree. But luckily for them, God had already put together a plan to save mankind, and Jesus voluntarily paid the price for Adam and Eve's sins and for our sins. So on the very day that Adam and Eve sinned, Jesus volunteered to pay their price and the entire world's price for sinning, and he delayed their immediate death. So this is what I'm calling corporate atonement. So he stepped in between God's death sentence and the sinners, and he volunteered to do this. So Jesus invites everyone to accept his sacrifice and find salvation and that's what we call individual atonement. But in order to have individual atonement, you had to be alive and to understand what God was offering. And that's what the corporate atonement gave you. It gave you a period of time to consider God's salvation offer and accept his atonement. So the corporate sins were were uh, handled twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. Two lambs a day were sacrificed. And of course, they were sacrificed at the bronze altar and their blood was sprinkled on the altar of incense in the, uh, in the sanctuary. So daily, corporate sins were forgiven by a morning sacrifice, and by an evening sacrifice. And this is generally called in the Bible the daily. So if we look at Numbers 28, verses 1 to 8, it says, The Lord Jesus said to Moses, Give this command to the Israelites, two lambs, one year old, without defect, as a regular or daily burnt offering each day, Offer one lamb in the morning and one lamb at twilight. So these two lambs were not sacrificed by the individual sinners in the community, 
but they were sacrificed by the priest for the general sins of the community. So the corporate service actually continues to this very day in heaven. And it's conducted by Jesus, but there's a difference in heaven. There are no animals that were sacrificed and are, or are being sacrificed in, in heaven for this corporate uh, service. Jesus has, extends his corporate grace over the entire earth by holding back the four winds of strife that it's talked about in the Bible. And this gives everyone on earth the opportunity to be saved. Otherwise, we would all be instantly killed by God. But Jesus stepped in, in the way between the wrath of God for disobeying God and sinning. And Jesus gives us opportunity to accept his sacrifice on the cross and have eternal, eternal life. So corporate atonement, what is it? So Jesus' future death on the cross covered Adam and Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden. Now you remember that the immediate death command by God, if they ate from the forbidden tree and later the entire world sin from immediate death, this is called corporate atonement. So when, when, when you're not immediately killed by God when you sin, this is what is covering you, corporate atonement. And what does it do? It delays the immediate death pen punishment for sinning and gives everyone time to consider God's offer of salvation. And as we individually confess our sins and ask God for forgiveness, our sins of our sins, forgiveness of our sins, we are saved by Jesus' sacrifice. This is corporate atonement. This is holding back the four winds of strife. This allows human beings that sin time to accept Jesus' sacrifice and be saved. So after Jesus died on the cross, Innocent lambs were no longer required to be sacrificed for our sins. It says here in Hebrews 9, verse 12, and we read, it says, He, that's Jesus, entered once for all into the holy places in heaven, not by means of the blood of goats or calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption for anyone who accepts Jesus as his Lord and Savior. So Jesus died on the cross once for all, and we are no longer required to sacrifice animals for God's forgiveness. Well, let's take a look at this. So the camp's daily corporate services have to do with what? Have to do with the logistics of covering the people's sins. Now this gets a little technical, so pay attention and I hope you can follow me here. There were millions of Israelites living in the camp in the desert. So each tribe was not physically able to have an atonement service each month. There were just too many of them, and they actually couldn't get to the sanctuary because of the physical limitations. So each tribe was therefore assigned a special month for them to confess their sins and ask God for forgiveness. So this was just a real practical way that God set this up. Each tribe was given a special month where they could come and confess their sins, and this would allow all the people in a year's time to get forgiveness for their sins. So this is kind of how the uh, tribes were laid out uh, around the sanctuary. So here's the sanctuary in the center, 
And you can see the 12 tribes were uh, arranged around that in uh, each side of the tabernacle. And uh, these are the numbers that is, are in the Bible for each of the tribes that when the census was taken. So the Bible teaches that a census was taken in 1446 B.C., and it indicated that the adult Israelite men, not women and not children, just the men, were 553,500. So if you add in the men and the women and the children, uh, this could easily be over 2 million, and there's some estimates that are much higher than that, but just for the sake of our examination today, we'll just say 2 million, because that's a sufficient. And you can look this up in Numbers 1, verse 46. So if you have 2 million Israelites, and you divide that by 12 months, so how many people per month would be going to the sanctuary for forgiveness? Well, that would be uh, 600... 66,666 per month, or if you broke it down uh, by day, it would be 2,777, or if you just put it by the hour, it's 115 people per hour. That's an awful lot, isn't it? So simple logistics require that each of the 12 tribes have a special month to bring their family sins to the sanctuary for forgiveness. So the other 11 tribes had to wait for their month. Now, this is the key thing that I want you to remember. What would happen if your month was 11 months away? Would you have to exist with these sins and not have forgiveness from God for 11 months? Or did God make provisions that your sins could still be forgiven? Let's take a look. So the 12 tribes needed God's atonement, that's forgiveness, for their sins, but the sanctuary did not physically have capacity to accommodate all 12 tribes monthly. So God instituted a daily corporate camp sacrificial system. A daily corporate camp sacrificial system. So what is that all about, and how does that have to do with the atonement service that we're studying? Well, stay tuned. So this daily service conducted by the regular priest covered the other 11 tribes until their month at the sanctuary came around. So each tribe here would have one month to go to the sanctuary to confess their sins and the other 11 tribes had to wait until their month was came around. So they, they could come and confess their sins in person and sacrifice animals at the sanctuary and get forgiveness if that was your month. The other 11 had to wait. So there were two types of sacrifices, as we found out in our last video. There was individual atonement, where a person comes to the sanctuary, they confess their sins on an animal, the animal is sacrificed, and their sins were transferred into the sanctuary. Well, it was the same with the corporate atonement. Sins committed by the leaders or the general population, they were daily confessed at the bronze altar, and at the golden altar of incense, their blood was put on the horns there. So the corporate sins happened twice a day. Forgiveness for corporate sins happened once in the morning and once in the evening. And that involved the bronze altar and the golden altar. And of course, this was officiated by a priest. In this situation, each sinner, he would come for his sins or his family sins, but in this case, for the corporate atonement, the priest would come 
for all the other 11 tribes that weren't able to come that particular month. So please remember this. The entire sanctuary service was God's method of teaching or illustrating to mankind a plan of salvation. And it was created by God the Father from the foundations of the world. So this whole plan of redemption that the Israelites practice in the desert, this is the plan of salvation that they're actually uh, pointing to by sacrificing a sinless lamb representing Jesus, by sacrificing two sinless lambs in the corporate atonement, they were also representing Jesus in the future. So this whole plan of salvation that God put together for the Israelites pointed forward to the sacrifice that Jesus uh, was going to make by being sacrificed on the cross. Again, if you have any comments, please send it to my email address, art, A-R-T, 2023, at cambig, that's C-A-M-B-I-G-U-E dot com. Or you can look at all of my videos if you want. You can go to H-T-T-P-S, Bible, Prophecy, dot, Libsync, L-I-B-S-Y-N, that's my podcast, BibleProphecy.Libsync.com and you can see all of my videos there and watch them at your leisure. Thanks for watching. Well, I'd like to welcome you back to the Tabernacle in the Desert series of studies. Today we'll be covering the Day of Atonement and if you haven't seen parts one and two, I would suggest that you stop right now and go back and pick up parts one and two because they all tie together and uh, you really need to get them as they are put together, as they were intended to go. So as I just mentioned, today we'll be covering the Day of Atonement. It's a very uh, important topic and a very interesting topic, and I think you'll probably learn some things here you might not have thought of before. Well, the Day of Atonement consists of several things. You know, individual people during the year, they will get atonement for their sins by coming to the sanctuary and confessing their sins and transferring their sins to the innocent lamb. And then that innocent lamb, its blood is transferred into the sanctuary. So individual atonement can be obtained that way. And also we covered what, what I'm calling corporate atonement. And that's a similar process, but it's for the overall uh, tribes that are encamped around the tabernacle. And this is where the officiating priest will come to the uh, sanctuary and he will have two lambs. He will sacrifice one lamb in the morning and one lamb in the evening. And he'll both use the bronze altar and the golden altar. So this is done daily for the general population of the camp. So we have the individual atonement and we have the daily corporate atonement. So, uh, you might say, I understand the individual sin service a, a little bit, and I understand the corporate or camp sin service a little bit from looking at the prior videos. But what is this yearly Day of Atonement? Well, that's what we're going to cover right now, the yearly Day of Atonement. And this consists of several things. So first off, it occurs once a year, and this is what is, it is called the sanctuary was cleansed. It was cleansed of what? It was cleansed of the accumulated sins, both the individual atonement of sins and the corporate sins. So once a year, the sanctuary was symbolically 
cleaned of these sins. And it's also called Yom Kippur uh, in modern-day vernacular and some other words. Uh, in, in the Bible, it's generally referred to as the Day of Atonement when it's uh, in English. And who officiates at this service? Well, for the individual atonement, this is just a regular priest. And for the corporate atonement, it's just a regular priest. But on the Day of Atonement, for the uh, yearly Day of Atonement, only the high priest officiates at this service. So this is a very special one-day service that's held each year. And so all the accumulated sins uh, on the earthly sanctuary were transferred to the scapegoat's head. So the sins that were transferred uh, daily by individual atonement and uh, daily by the corporate atonement that were transferred into the sanctuary on the, on the uh, yearly day of atonement, those sins were transferred to the head of the scapegoat is what it's called in the Bible. Now the scapegoat represents the devil. So the sins were transferred out of the sanctuary and onto the scapegoat. So this is the cleansing process of the sanctuary. This is how the sanctuary was cleansed. The sins were transferred out to the head of the scapegoat by the high priest. And then that goat was turned loose. It was led into the desert by a strong man, and it was left to die into the desert. So this was the essential process that went on during the Day of Atonement. Now, I have simplified this greatly just so we can uh, quickly get through all the main topics, and I don't want to lose my uh, audience here with a lot of little details that are important, but we want to stay on our main track so we can see overall what the process is here that God has put together. So again, we have the personal sins were put onto the uh, sinless lamb or other animals and that animal was burnt on the bronze altar. The corporate sins, there were two lambs, one in the morning and one in the evening, and those lambs were sacrificed by a priest, and the blood from these lambs were put on the horns of the bronze altar and also on the horns of the golden altar in the table of meeting. And so... That's how the sins were transferred into the sanctuary, through the blood offering of the lambs. So the the sins of the individual and the corporate sins were transferred into the sanctuary. So once a year, on the Day of Atonement, also called Yom Kippur, the official officiating high priest, uh, he conducted the service and the sins that were transferred into the sanctuary were transferred again to the scapegoat's head. Now this scapegoat represents the devil. So the sins that were uh, transferred into the sanctuary were all put onto the scapegoat's head, and then that scapegoat was led off into the desert to die. So this is the process, in essence, that goes on during the Day of Atonement. Now, there's other very interesting elements to this service that went on, and I'm going to leave that up to you mostly to uh, get your Bibles out and study that for yourself. But this is the essence uh, of how the individual and corporate sins were put into the sanctuary and then put onto the the scapegoat, the Azazel it's also called, onto the scapegoat's head, and that represented the devil. So once a year on the Day of Atonement, in the month of Tishra, a special service is conducted 
by the high priest to cleanse the sanctuary of the accumulated sins that were transferred into the sanctuary during the year. This is the Day of Atonement. That's the main service that went on. So nine days of trumpets, what does that mean? Well, the Day of Atonement is preceded by nine days of blowing the trumpets throughout the camp. And that was done by all the various uh, priests. There were many, many priests that were, uh, were served in the sanctuary. So they would go throughout the camp blowing the uh, horn, and that would notify the people to get right with God and their fellow man. Get right means to ask forgiveness of their fellow man, make things right, and ask forgiveness from God. So the blowing of the trumpets occurred during the first nine days of the month of Tishra. Now, in the Jewish calendar, uh, the calendar is quite different than our, our modern calendar. Obviously, the month's names were different. And the year started off differently, but I'm not going to get into that uh, in this uh, video. But in the seventh month of Tishra, that usually happens between uh, September and October, that is when the, the uh, trumpets blow. So for the first nine days, the trumpets sound every single day. So you would, uh, as a person in the camp, you would wake up in the morning and you would hear these trumpets blowing on every single day for the next nine days. So this was a notification to you to get right with your fellow man and get right with God. And then on the 10th day of the month, this was the Day of Atonement. So the Feast of Trumpets, as it's called, began on the first Day of the seventh month, just before the Day of Atonement, and it, it was to a, a call or to call the individuals to a personal introspection. In other words, look at yourself. Are you right with God? Are you right with your fellow man? And it requires them to repent and ask forgiveness. So during this time, there were burnt offerings and sin offerings were brought before the Lord, and people were to get right with God and their fellow man. Well, what about the ones that don't get right? So those that did not get right, they chose not to get right with their fellow man, and they chose not to get right with God. And in the Bible, it says that they were put out of the camp. They were kicked out of the camp. And probably to die in the wilderness. And you can look this up in Leviticus 23 and in Numbers 29 and study it further. But the thing I want you to remember is that preceding the Day of Atonement, where your sins are transferred to the devil or to the Azazel goat, there were a number of days where the trumpets blew and the trumpets were a warning from God to get right with God and your fellow man. So the first nine days, you can read that in Leviticus 23, these are what you would call a redemptive trumpets. There was opportunity for you, the sinner, to get right with your fellow man and get right with God and you would not be lost. So you were to confess your sins, get right with God, and get right with your fellow man. So those persons who did not get right with God prior to the Day of Atonement were put out of the camp. That's the wording in the Bible. And they did not partake of the transfer of their sins to the scapegoat's head. That's the key thing here. They did not participate with the transfer of their sins to the scapegoats. Their sins were still on themselves. So let's take a look at what we can re we get uh, and, and, and learn from this. 
So remember that this yearly atonement service is an example for us to better understand the elements of God's salvation plan. So here are the key things I'd like you to remember. Number one, God's warning trumpets sound prior to the Day of Atonement and were to alert the Israelites to get right with God and their fellow man. So the the trumpets were a warning sound to get right with God, and they occurred just before the Day of Atonement. And number two, if a person disregards God's instructions and does not ask forgiveness for their sins, and if they were put out of the camp, is what the Bible says, they were lost and they most likely died outside of the camp. So the trumpets were a key thing that happened before the Day of Atonement. One more thing on this topic. More on this topic will be coming up as we investigate the Great Tribulation and its parallel events that precede the second coming of Jesus. So these events here that happened in the Old Testament are going to happen again during the Great Tribulation And stay tuned for that because it will be very enlightening for you and I'm hoping that you will gain a blessing from it. Well, this is the end of part three. If you have any comments or questions, please send them to art, A-R-T, 2023 at Cambig, that's my last name, C-A-M-B-I-G-U-E dot com. And you can also go to my podcast and see all of my videos. And it's, called, it's at https bibleprophecy.libsing. That's the company that hosts my podcast, libsyn.com. And all my videos are located there. So I hope you've gained, gained a blessing from this uh, video. And be sure you stay tuned for part four and five and see the culmination of the study of the Day of Atonement. God bless, and I hope you're getting a blessing from these. Welcome back to our study on the tabernacle in the desert. Today we're going to continue with our study of the Day of Atonement, and this is part four of five. And again, I want to uh, encourage you, if you have not seen parts one, two, and three, that I would stop right here and go back and pick those up. Uh, They're very short, but they do build one upon the other, and I encourage you to do that, to uh, view one, two, and three before you view part four. So, God's plan to eliminate sin and save mankind. What is it? So, we're going to take a look at more of the big picture in God's plan to eliminate sin and save mankind. Now, this this, uh, picture here that we're going to be going through, it's uh, pretty complicated. And it actually, it took me several weeks to try to condense this down into this one picture. So uh, you may want to uh, stop it as we go through it and uh, take a look at it. But it's a a very high-level overview of God's plan of salvation. So in the beginning, that God, that's Jesus, created the heavens and the earth. And you can see, I'm not going to read them all, but you can see I have uh, many Bible references here, and this one is Genesis 1.1. So during creation week, God uh, created the Garden of uh, Eden, and he 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 put Adam and Eve there in the Garden of Eden, and he told Adam and Eve not to eat of the uh, apple 
actually was a fruit on that tree. And in the, he said, in the day that you eat of that fruit, you will, you will die. That was a sin uh, for them to eat of that fruit. And so God, it's very clear, read it in Genesis 2, 16. So in the day that you eat of it, you will die. So God told Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And if they did uh, eat or eat from that tree, they would be immediately killed. Not next week, not next year, not 500 years from now, not a thousand years from now. They would be immediately killed on that very day. But Jesus volunteered from eternity, that's what it says in the Bible, to pay their penalty, their death penalty, and die at a future point on the cross for their sins and for everyone else's sins on earth. So as people on earth accept Jesus' free gift of salvation, they are saved. So it's totally a free gift, but you need to accept it. So this delay in administering the death decree, I am calling it corporate atonement. And it gives the individual sinner the opportunity to repent of their sins and to accept God's salvation conditions. And this salvation process Says where they were, where they accept God's salvation conditions, that is called individual atonement. So God starts off here with a blanket corporate atonement for the whole world, including Adam and Eve. And the, God did not destroy Adam and Eve the very instant, the very day that they ate from the tree of good and evil. The reason God didn't do that is because Jesus volunteered from the foundation of uh, the world to stand in for our uh, sins. So Jesus, the Lamb who agreed to, to be slain for our sins from the creation of the world, and that's found in Revelation 13, 8. You can go look that up. So Jesus is our Savior He's both our corporate Savior and our individual atonement Savior. So that's why Adam and Eve weren't killed that very day. God said, in the very day that you eat of this tree, you will be killed. You will be murdered. That's a sin. But Jesus stepped in the way between God's uh, uh, warning that they would be killed, and he said, I will save mankind, and I will be a sacrifice in the future for anyone that accepts my conditions. So for 6,000 years, and, and that's about, if you go through the Bible and you look at all the, the begots, if you look at all the lineage of the people, we have about 6,000 years from Adam and Eve until today. So we have been going through the process of sinning all these years, all these 6,000 years, and both corporate atonement and individual atonement have been uh, going on, have been active during this time. And so this is a new concept for many, many people, this idea that there is this thing called corporate atonement. You won't find those exact words in the Bible, but you will find the concept there, and I'll show it to you. So the corporate atonement, you'll notice here, it goes to a certain point, then stops, and the individual atonement goes past that point and goes even further. Now, I got to tell you that these lines are not to scale. They're for illustration only. So I hope you give me a little slack on that. But I'm trying to get a lot of concept on this one sheet. So right here, after about 4,000 years, 
Jesus was crucified on the cross. Prior to him being crucified on the cross, the animal sacrifice, the sacrifices that were performed by various uh, people, they were looking forward to Jesus, and we can read that in Hebrews 9. So take a look at all the people that we can read in the Old Testament that sacrificed animals with the anticipation of looking forward to Jesus dying on the cross and fulfilling what these sacrifices represented. Of course, Adam and Eve, they uh, Jesus brought them a, a, a sheep skin when they were hiding in the in the bushes, and they saw that they were naked, and so they got some bushly or bushes, some leaves from bushes, and they covered themselves. And God said, "Adam and Eve, where are you?" But God knew where they were, and He brought them a sacrifice of uh, a, a lamb's skin to clothe them with. And then later on, we read about Cain and Abel, where one sacrificed his own works, his own hands from his garden, and the other sacrificed according to what God had told Adam and Eve, and they told their children, and the other sacrificed an animal, and the animal was accepted by God, whereas the the works by their the food that he grew was not acceptable to God. And of course, Noah. What did Noah do, do as soon as he landed on solid earth afterwards? Well, he built a, t- a altar and sacrificed animals. So that's what Noah did. And this is all before the cross. And of course, the famous Bible story, very touching, where Abraham and Isaac sacrifice, and God did provide a sacrifice, and uh, Abraham did not have to sacrifice his son. God provided the sacrifice with the lamb that was caught in the bush. And then later on, Jacob's sacrifice. So there's many examples in the Old Testament where animals were sacrificed, but they were looking forward to the ultimate sacrifice of Christ on the cross. So after Jesus was sacrificed on the cross, that there was no more need for animal sacrifices. Christ's sacrifice, says in Hebrews, was once for all time. So from the cross on, animal sacrifices were no longer efficient. Let me back up here. So we can see that the corporate atonement comes to an end at some point, and you can read about that in Revelation 8, and that the individual atonement terminates also at a separate point. And what are those points? Well, this is coming up in the near future, and I'm calling it, this is when God's wrath is released. In the Revelation, it's called the Great Tribulation. And during this Great Tribulation, there will be seven first plagues, and there'll be seven last plagues. So initially, the seven first plagues will decimate the earth, and then the seven last plagues will fall on all the wicked people. So this is what is called in the book of Revelation. It's called the Great Tribulation. Other people call it just a time of trouble, but it is a period of time just before Jesus comes back to earth. And when Jesus comes back to earth, he gathers the saints in the sky. He raises the saints that are asleep in the grave, and he takes them for a thousand years in heaven to the heavenly mansion that he has prepared for us. And you can find reference to that in Revelation 20. So if you notice, there's 6,000 years here and 1,000 years here for a total of 7,000 years. Well, at the end of the 1,000 years in heaven, what happens? 
Well, this is where the New Jerusalem comes back to earth, and this is where the Jesus conducts the great white throne judgment. And Jesus is going to be the going to be the one that judges everyone, not God the Father, not the Holy Spirit. God the Father has entrusted Jesus. He has entrusted Jesus that all judgment will be conducted by him. And there will be two parts of this judgment. So all the lost souls over the ages, the lost souls will be, will be raised. And the second death is when God's punishment is met out to all these various people throughout the ages, and they will all be, uh, they will be personally uh, uh, spoken to by Jesus. Jesus will tell each and every person from all the ages how he tried to save them and all the opportunities they had to be saved. But in spite of that, they chose not to follow Jesus. And so the, he will tell them, that based on their sins they conducted during their lifetime, these, this is the punishment that you will receive for your sins that you, you conducted on earth. And, and they will have to pay back for all their sins they conducted. And then finally, they will be burnt up. They will be stubble under our feet. And you can read this in Malachi uh, 4, verse 3. And so these people will not be burning forever and ever and ever. There is a finite period of time where the lost souls will have to pay back for their evil deeds, but at the end, they will be stubble under everyone's feet. And also, the devil and his angels, the scapegoat, he will receive on his head all the sins that he has caused the saints that were brought to heaven. All these saints that were brought to heaven when Jesus comes back, all the sins that they committed during their life will be put on the head of the devil. And he and his evil angels will have to pay back all of these various evil things that were they caused to happen. But finally, there will be a come a day, and I don't know how long this will be, but there will become a day when the devil will, will, will be burnt up, and he again, he will be uh, stubble under our feet. And you read this in Malachi 8.13. Now, let me show you how this ties back to the Day of Atonement. So, on the Day of Atonement, the sanctuary was cleansed, and the sins were placed on the head of the scapegoat, and the scapegoat was led out into the desert on that very day. Well, that happened on a single day. But as you notice here, and by the way, the scapegoat here, is represents the devil. The sins of all the people that have asked forgiveness from God, the sins that were cleansed from the sanctuary, will be put onto the devil and his angels, evil angels, and they will have to pay back for all the evil deeds that they caused people to do over the many thousands of years on earth. So this is the big picture of how salvation works. Jesus, before even creating the world, he volunteered just in case sin should raise its head on earth. So he volunteered to die on the cross for sinners. He's going to take sinners back, the, the, the saints back to heaven. And the sinners on earth that are alive, they will be burnt up during the last seven plagues. And they will be, the saints will be with Jesus for a thousand years in heaven. 
And when Jesus comes back to earth at the end of the thousand years, that is the white throne judgment and the the evil uh, people on earth that are asleep in the grave, Jesus will raise them. Jesus will tell them what they're going to have to pay back for their sinful deeds. And then he will also raise the devil or allow the devil and his evil angels who are currently uh, held captive in the abyss. They are alive, but they're in the abyss. And he will tell them what they're going to have to pay back. And they will be, uh, they will have so many years of, of uh, punishment until all the evil deeds that they cause others to commit are paid back. Then they will be burnt up and they will be stubble. So in both cases, evil people and the evil angels will be no more. They will be stubble under our feet. So, this looks pretty gruesome. Looks like God is a God of wrath. Let's take a look at what God has done in the past and how he has exhibited his wrath. So, wrath, number one, that's clearly outlined in the Bible has to do with Noah's Ark. So, this was God's wrath in action. So, in Genesis 6, we read, Noah was a righteous man, and he walked faithfully uh, with God. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become. All the people had corrupted their ways. And God said, I am going to put an end to all the people, and I am going to destroy both the people and the earth. So God made a decision that he was going to destroy all the evil people and the earth. And so what did he do? Well, it took him 120 years for this to actually happen. Noah preached for 120 years, and out of all those people that Noah preached, only uh, his family Only eight people on earth heeded God's warning and survived the global flood. There were probably, and these are just estimates, but there were probably between millions and possibly billions of people on the earth when the flood uh, encompassed the earth and drowned all these people. So this was God's wrath at work, and... uh, People say, well, God is not going to destroy millions of people. Well, he's done that in the past when they have reached the limit of God's tolerance. Let's look at another example of God's wrath, and this is example two. And this has to do with Sodom and Gomorrah and where they were burned up with a burning sulfur. So God decided, he made a decision, he looked at Sodom and Gomorrah, And it doesn't say in the Bible how long, but after a period of time, God decided that he had to destroy both Sodom and Gomorrah. And actually, there's a few other cities nearby also. So two angels arrived at Sodom and said to Lot, he told Lot to get out of here because God sent us, sent the angels, to destroy this place because, the, uh, because of the outcry to the Lord against the people of Sodom and Gomorrah is so great that God, God the Father, has sent us to destroy it. So the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah and destroyed all the living in the cities. Now I paraphrase this in my own words. You can look it up in Genesis 19, verse 1. Now, from the time God decided that Sodom and Gomorrah was so corrupt until the time he destroyed it, uh, we we don't really know how long that was. But it was, uh, I don't know, I think it was was probably at least months. It could have been quite a long time. 
But at some point in time, God sent two angels, or a number of angels, I don't know if it was two, he sent some angels, yeah, he did two angels, to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. So these angels are very, very powerful. And Sodom and Gomorrah was burnt up. Everybody in the cities was burnt up. And the whole city, Sodom and Gomorrah and several others, were destroyed. So this is God's wrath at work in another example. So there are several concrete examples in the Bible where God's tolerance with the wickedness of earth comes to an end, and he he acts. Well, this is the end of part four of five, and you can send your comments and questions to me at my email address. It's it's at art, A-R-T, 2023, at Cambie, that's my last name, C-A-M-B-I-G-U-E dot com. So if you have any comments or questions, send them to me on that email address. And you can look at all of my videos. I have a podcast. Uh, Here's the uh, full podcast address. H-T-T-P-S Bible Prophecy dot Lipsing. That's the company I use to uh, host my podcast dot com. So if you go to that uh, prof, uh, podcast address, you can see all of my videos. Well, I'd like to welcome you back to the Tabernacle in the Desert video series and we have been studying the Day of Atonement. Now, if you have not had the opportunity to view the prior four videos, I would recommend that you stop right now and go back and start with video number one. They're all fairly short and they will give you the proper background so that you will understand what we're covering in this video. Without that background, this video probably won't make a lot of sense to you. So I highly recommend you start at video number one and watch those in sequence before you view this video. Now in our last video, number four, we developed this overall picture. And this picture covers 6,000 years, all the way from Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, all the way up through today, the, at the end of this here. So we can see in this picture that Jesus is our Savior, and Jesus agreed to step in the way between God's pronouncement that if Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the tree of of good and evil in the Garden of Eden, they would die on that very day. But Jesus stepped in the way and postponed their death until they could have individual atonement for their sins. Well, anyway, today we are going to look at this part of the uh, illustration here, and we're going to look right here. We're going to look at God's wrath during the Great Tribulation. And we're going to start off looking again at corporate atonement. And it says here, corporate atonement terminates. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. So God's final wrath is coming. That's our title of this this sheet here. God's wrath is coming during this great tribulation that will last 1,335 days. And this great tribulation will cover the first seven plagues and the last seven plagues. But first off, let's take a look at the day when corporate atonement terminates. What will cause that corporate atonement to terminate. 
So this is what we're initially going to focus on. What will cause God's wrath to be released on earth and corporate atonement to be terminated? What will cause that? Well, the word wrath is used in the Bible in a number of places, and it has several different meanings. And here I have three different meanings, wrongdoing, judgments, and death by ex uh, execution. And wrongdoing means when you uh, do something like pain. Pain is sort of God's wrath if you were but if you put a ladder up against your house to clean the gutters of, of leaves and you fall off of that ladder and break your neck, obviously there'll be pain, it could even be death associated with that. So that's, you did something wrong, you fell off the ladder. Or if you were had a life where you were drinking uh, alcohol or smoking or doing something bad your whole life, well, that wrongdoing will have consequences. Could be death or could be sickness. So that's what this first type of wrath is about. The second type of wrath is judgments. God sends both redemptive and destructive judgments to people. And we're gonna be looking at that today and then finally, the third type of wrath from God is death by execution. And this is actually the second death that the Bible talks about. This is the permanent death when God uh, releases his, his eternal punishment on the evil. So this is eternal death that results from this. So, but we're going to focus in right now on this type of wrath, judgments, both redemptive and destructive. So we're going to learn that the first seven trumpets are redemptive in nature, and the last seven trumpets are destructive in nature. So the first seven, like I said, and the last seven will, will be covered in this area. So I believe that the earth is at a tipping point. What does that mean? Well, that means that the evil things on earth are vastly outweighing the good things on earth. So when, once you get to a tipping point, there's no going back. Evil is taking over on this earth, not in any unique country, but in all countries of the world. So I believe that planet Earth has reached the tipping point like in Noah's day. We read here from Luke 17, it says, as, and as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. That means when the Son of Man comes. So the people on earth, earth they ate, they drank, they married wives that were given in marriage, until what? Until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the floods came and destroyed them all. So they were doing things as usual without even realizing that God's wrath was coming on earth and it was going to destroy all of them. The floods came and everyone on earth was destroyed except for Noah and his direct family. My study of God's word indicates that God is allowing 6,000 years of sin to exist on earth before he releases his wrath and terminates sin on earth and the devil. So you might ask, why 6,000 years? 
Well, God is allowing the devil, and he, the devil is called the prince of this world in the Bible. So he, God is allowing the devil to fully de deploy his false accusations on earth against God and exposing the devil's evil nature for everyone to see. The devil is so cunning that it's hard for some people to see how evil he really is. But over this 6,000 years, God is allowing the devil to fully deploy his, uh, acquisi his acquisitions against God. Through his cunning, he, that's the devil, shall cause deceit to prosper for 6,000 years under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He, that's the devil, shall destroy many in their uh, prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes. So who is the prince of princes? That's Jesus. But he, that's the devil, shall be broken by Jesus and and the devil's ashes will be under our feet, but he will be broken, but without human means. That means that mankind will not be able to break or defeat the devil, but Jesus will be. Jesus is, tells us in the Bible in Daniel 7 verse 25 that he, Jesus, is the one that is going to defeat the devil and he's going to be ashes under our feet. He'll be burnt up eventually. If you have comments, please send them to uh, me at my email address. It's art2023 at my last name, C-A-M-B-I-G-U-E dot com. Or if you want to look at some of my other videos, you can go to HTTPS BibleProphecy.Libsyn, that's the company that hosts my podcast, L-I-B-S-Y-N.com. And you can look at all the videos that I have, they're all free. So we pray that you've gotten a blessing from this video series, and uh, we pray that Jesus will come soon and we'll all go to heaven together. Tabernacle in the Desert video series, and we have been studying the Day of Atonement. Now, if you have not had the opportunity, I would recommend that you stop right now and go back and start with video number one. They're all fairly short, and they will give you the proper background so that you will understand what we're covering in this video. Without that background, this video probably won't make a lot of sense to you. So I highly recommend you start at video number one and watch those in sequence. You know, seven is a favorite complete number with God. Now God, I don't know why, but certain numbers he has as favorites and seven is one of them. So let's take a look at what seven might mean. If you look at the 6,000 years on earth right now, there were about 2,000 years where the fathers of our, uh, in the Bible, were uh, history of the fathers. And then the Jews came for another 2,000 years. And then the church age for another 2,000 years. So we have been through about 6,000 years and then we're going to have a millennium rest. That's a thousand year Sabbath in heaven. So where are we in this picture here? So I believe that when you add up all the Bible has to say about genealogies, when you add up everything the Bible has to say about history 
and about the prophetic time periods, when you put it all together, the picture only shows 7,000 years long, and that includes the 1,000 years that we'll spend in heaven. That's the millennium rest. So where are we on this 7,000-year journey? Well, I think we're right here. I think the 7,000 years are behind us, and we're in a short delay right here before Jesus comes. This is where we are right here. Just past the 6,000 years, and we're in a short delay right now. In Revelation 6, verse 17, we read, For the great day of God's wrath is coming, and who shall be able to stand? And this is true. When God's wrath is released on earth during this last days, no one will be able to stand against it. Revelation 7, verse 1. And after these things, I saw four angels, and this is, these are figuratively speaking, standing on the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth. This is God's wrath being held back that the winds, that is the strife on earth, should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, or on the tree, trees. So God is holding back the four winds of strife, the four angels that have been given the first four trumpets. And God says, do not hurt the earth, that's trumpet number one, Neither the sea, that's trumpet number two, nor the trees, that's trumpet number three, until, until what? Until we have sealed the 144,000 servants of our God in their foreheads. These 144,000 servants are God's spokespersons on earth. So what is God waiting for? He's waiting for one thing. He's waiting for the 144,000 servants to be selected and sealed in their foreheads. And then the four winds of strife on earth will be released. Well, the devil will be broken. The devil will be defeated. In Daniel 8, verses 19 through 25, it says, I am here to tell you what will happen later in the time of God's wrath. This is an angel speaking to Daniel. What you have seen pertains to the very end of time. That's where we are right now. When their sins, when earth's sins is at its height, a fierce king the devil, will rise to power. And the devil will become very strong, but not by his own power. God will allow the devil to fully exhibit his evil ways. And he will cause a shocking amount of destruction. That's the devil. The devil will cause a shocking amount of destruction and succeed in everything he does. Well, this is not very very uh, positive news, is it? If the devil succeeds in everything he does, this is going to be very, very bad for people on earth. It says he will destroy powerful leaders. He will devastate the holy people. These are God's saints. He will be a master of deception and will become arrogant, and he will destroy many without warning. So this looks to me like the devil is not going to be destroyed here, doesn't it? He will even take on the prince of princes, that's Jesus, 
the prince of princes, in battle, but he, the devil, says, will be broken, but not by human hands. So the devil in the last days on earth, it will look as if he is winning. Because everything he does, he will, he will destroy everyone that he can. He will devastate, says he will devastate the holy people. These are God's saints. But we, when we continue to read on, we read that the prince of princes, that's Jesus, he will destroy the devil. He will be broken, but not by human power. So I'm going to reword 2 Peter 3, verse 3. You can get your Bible out and read along with me if you want. It says, I want you to remember what Jesus said, that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. Jesus is being patient for our sake, for yours and mine and people on earth because he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent and be saved. That's Jesus' goal. So God's wrath will come as unexpectedly as a thief in the night. The heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements, that's even the rocks and the things that make up the earth, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire. That's a pretty hot fire. And the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment and be 100% burnt up. Now, I've rewritten this here, and I've made it a little more clearer but you go take a look at 2 Peter verse 3 and starting with verse uh, chapter 3, verse 3. Take a look at that. It's a very startling uh, prophecy in the Bible. So the question that everyone has is, has the earth reached this evil point for God's wrath to be released. Are, where are we in the timetable of God? Is his wrath about to be released on earth? Well, let's take a look at a few headlines. And I could put in, you know, 100 times more than what I'm going to show you. These are just a few of them that I pulled over the last um, couple of months. Today's headlines. Well, here's one massacre. Orlando mass shooting, deadliest in U.S. history. Disneyland gets woke. Who would have ever thought this? Disneyland gets woke. This is where we used to take our kids and have a safe, wholesome entertainment. LGBT affirming youth groups offers drag lessons for minors. Over here, the Daily Mirror, 50 kids a week sent to sex change clinics. These are today's headlines. Look at this one. The Satanic Temple after school Satan Club. So they have an official club sanctioned by the school system and it's the Satanic Temple that puts it on. And of course Biden says Putin is not joking about nuclear war. So are we getting closer to a nuclear war? This is in the headlines almost every day. So 
So the blame game over food shortages. This was in a headline. Now, this is some days this is uh, happening and then other, other days there's food to be had. But I believe in the coming days ahead, there'll be more and more food shortages. Russian gas pipeline blown up. So who blew up the pipeline? Who blew up the pipeline? That puts millions and millions of Europeans and other people around the world at risk for very many different things. But who blew up the pipeline? Well, there's all kinds of conjectures on that. Virginia lawmaker. Schools are actively pushing kids towards gender transition. So the schools are initiating this. And of course, Ukraine war leading to World War III. You'll see this in the headlines quite often. Parents and schools clash over students' gender. Now, I could put up about a hundred slides on this, but this is a very, very hot topic in, in the schools, at home, with doctors, with parents. Churches are closing down. Attendance is down. This is around the world. Gay preachers are being accepted. Two men marry each other, and the church that they're in accepts that as normal. Global takeover. Now, this looks like a fairly uh, uh, simple little headline, but if you look into this, there are very ominous things going on in the background that we don't even know about. Global takeover by these billionaires. Climate activists cause farms to close. This happens to be, you can hardly see this picture, but this happens to be a picture in the Netherlands where they are closing or trying to close 30% of the farms. And there's gonna be food shortages, famines are, gonna, are possible, what's next? And this one takes a little bit of looking at opium deaths. So this was 2016, and you can see by the color where the highest percentage of deaths are back in 2016. And here's one that's a couple of years older, and you can see that it's swept right across the, the United States. High school student dies from accidental fentanyl overdose. Fentanyl is all over the world, killing people uh, left and right. So what will tomorrow's headlines be? Will they be better or worse than today's? Well, if I had the time, I could have updated this here with the headlines from the last couple of days, and they would none of them would have been better they all would have been uh, equal or worse than what I just showed you. So how will we know when the corporate global atonement has been terminated? This is real important for you to understand this. And in order for you to understand what the corporate atonement is, you need to look at the prior videos than just number five here. I go through that in much, much more detail. But so how do we know when the corporate atonement has been terminated by God and his wrath is about to be released? So if you look over here, you can see that I highlighted at the beginning of this great tribulation right here, the corporate atonement ends. So what will cause God's wrath to be released on earth and corporate atonement to be terminated? And God's seven redemptive trumpets and seven destructive trumpets are released. 
Well, it has to do with the sensor. So here's our little picture here. Corporate atonement terminated. Individual atonement terminated further on. This is God's wrath being released. So what does this sensor have to do with anything? Well, that sensor will be released right here, right at the beginning of the Great Tribulation. If you recall, on the earlier studies, I talk about the two daily lambs that were sacrificed on earth for the general population to, to uh, so God's wrath would not be released on the general population. They would have a chance to uh, repent and ask God's forgiveness. Well, at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, right here, the corporate atonement will be terminated. So, so the general uh, grace that God is giving earth will be terminated. And so then the seven redemptive trumpets will start to sound. So you will know when the corporate or global atonement is terminated. So how are you going to know that? So that, and the reason it's important, that, that'll indicate that, that God's wrath is being released. So when you see and feel and hear the following. This is in Revelation 8.5. Then the angel took the censer, this one right here, the censer, located near the golden altar and filled it with fire from the golden altar. Don't forget there was fire on that altar 24-7. And the angel threw this censer down to the earth symbolically. And there were noises, thunderings, lightning, and earthquake. This is God's four judgments. So when the censer is cast to the earth, God's four judgments will be released. And the seven first trumpets will sound. So what happens next? What happens when these trumpets sound? Well, the great tribulation is what happens. So we are here. We've gone through 6,000 years of the fathers, the Jews, and the church period. We are right here just before the millennium. So we are right over here. We are just before the corporate atonement is terminated, just before that happens. So we are, we are coming right up to that. It could happen any time in the future. So when this happens, God's wrath will be released. The first seven plagues will happen, and then the seven last plagues will happen. And the great tribulation that we know already how long it will last, 1,335 days long. That's in Daniel 11:11. 11, 11. So when the seven trumpets sound, we will know that we are into the great tribulation. So you remember... In the Old Testament, I showed you this, the day, the trumpets blow before the Day of Atonement. And what happens on the Day of Atonement? The sanctuary is cleansed, and the sins are put on the head of the scapegoat, which represents the devil. Well, that's what's going to happen here in the end days. Here we read, the Great Tribulation, 1,335 days long, as found in Daniel 11:11 11, 11, and Revelation 6:7. These are the first seven trumpets and the seven last trumpets. So in Daniel 8, 
verse 19, the angel Gabriel said to Daniel, I am going to tell you what will happen later in the time of God's wrath. This is what he is telling Daniel, what will happen later in the time of God's wrath. So we have the first seven trumpets. These are redemptive. Why are they called redemptive? Because during this time, every person on earth that's alive will get to know the truth. The Holy Spirit will be poured out with great strength, and every person on earth will know what the truth is, and they will have the opportunity of accepting God's truth and being on God's side or not. So there, was, there's just going to be sheep and goats at the end of the first seven trumpets. And they last 1260 days. These are not in proportion, but you can see by the number of days how long they are. So the seven trumpets, the seven redemptive trumpets, they will last 1260 days. It's quite a long time. So everyone on earth will have the opportunity to hear God's truth and either be on God's side or be on the devil's side. At the end of the last trumpet, the seven last plagues will occur and they last about 75 days. So the total of 1260 days plus 75 days adds up to 1335 days. And then at the end of the seventh trumpet is when Jesus comes. That's the second coming of Jesus. So during the first redemptive trumpets, the saints are sealed. And during the seven last plagues, the wicked are put out of the camp. Remember, the ones that did not get right with God on the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament, they were put out of the camp. Their sins were not transferred to the scapegoat sins. They, their, their sins stayed upon their own head. So here the wicked are, are put out of the camp, so to speak, and the wicked are punished during this time, and they will all be killed by the sword that comes out of Jesus' mouth when he comes. So at the end of this period of time, at the end of 1,335 days, the saints will be with Jesus going to heaven, and everyone on earth will be dead from the sword that comes out of Jesus' mouth. So the Great Tribulation lasts 1,335 days. Now take a look at this text here. Daniel 12, verse 11. This is a very powerful text, if you understand what it's saying. And from the time that the daily sacrifice, remember I, we talked about that? These were the two special lambs in the morning, one lamb in the evening, the other lamb. From the time that the daily sacrifice service, service is, is the proper name for that is taken away. Where is it taken away? It's not going on on earth right now. It's taken away in heaven. Jesus is interceding for the people on earth so that his wrath, God's wrath, will not be released on earth. So the daily service in heaven is for the benefit of mankind in general. But it says from the time that the daily service is taken away, that corporate atonement is terminated, and the abomination of desolation, that's a death decree, is set up, there'll be 1,290 days. I'll explain that in another video, but we can set that aside for now. Blessed are he who waits and comes to the end of the 1,335 days. So that's the ones that can make it through the Great Tribulation and come to the end of the Great Tribulation, end of the 1,335 days, 
and Jesus comes and takes them to heaven. So this is the great tribulation. Now, I'm not going to go through this in any great detail here. I have other videos that I go through this in. But if you take a look here, Revelation 13.1, it talks about a sea beast that is formed after the first four trumpets sound. And this sea beast is called Babylon. It's got seven heads and ten horns. So this is the first four trumpets occur and Babylon is formed. And then later on in Revelation 9, verse 5, talks about the earth beast that emerges during the fifth trumpet. And this earth beast, it will be lamb-like. In other words, it will be peaceful, loving, and kind, like Jesus, for five months. And then during the sixth trumpet, this earth beast changes its colors and becomes dragon-like, like the devil. And this is when the mark of the beast will be uh, handed out. So the mark of the beast, the dreaded 666, and the death decree is issued here. So the earth beast is in Revelation 13, 11, and it talks about the lamb's horns and the dragon's mouth. Well, I'm not trying to cover this in detail in this picture, only to show you that when the daily service in heaven is terminated, is taken away, that the 1,335 days that are indicated by this so simple illustration starts. And when this is finished, when we get to the end of the 1,335 days, Jesus will come to get his saints and take us with him to heaven, to the home that he has prepared for us in heaven. Well, we've covered an awful lot on this video series, covered a lot of material. So it's our prayer that you have received a blessing from it. Uh, if you could understand this by going through it once, uh, well, that's great. But take your time, go back and look at it again. And if you have questions and you want some additional help, uh, send me an email. But this is coming up very soon. We know that the corporate atonement is going to end very soon, and the Great Tribulation will be started then. And think about this. Jesus, the creator of the universe, volunteered his life to save you and to save me from our sins and offers us all eternal life. What a God we serve. If you have comments, please send them to uh, me at my email address. It's art2023 at my last name, C-A-M-B-I-G-U-E dot com. Or if you want to look at some of my other videos, you can go to HTTPS Bible Prophecy dot That's the company that hosts my podcast, L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. And you can look at all the videos that I have. They're all free. So we pray that you've gotten a blessing from this video series. And uh, we pray that Jesus will come soon and we'll all go to heaven together. <laughs>